Hey guys, and welcome to another rip roaring adventure in cool stuff with CTA Live. My name is Dave Hurley. We haven't met. I uh, want to uh, welcome you first off to CTA Live. And uh, what Church Training Academy is here to do is to uh, teach small and medium sized churches how to use and exploit the snot out of technology and media and ultimately change people's lives. That's what we're all about. Today, guys, we're going to be talking about the new stuff from iOS, right? Or from Apple. iOS is the operating system for all their mobile devices. We're going to be talking about the new iPhone 8, the 8 Plus, the the Watch version 3. We're going to be talking about the new iPhone X. I'm always going to call it X. It's an iPhone 10. <laughs> so the iPhone X. We're going to talk about the uh, Apple TV, which is something that a lot of churches are, are deploying around their campus. So uh, there's some really cool uh, updates and stuff that have come to that. So we're, we're going to be going through that. Uh, I've got my friend Caleb Rutherford. Uh, is going to be joining us here in just a few minutes. Um, he is a, um, he, he is actually, it's cool. Caleb is a, is a stay at home dad, um, raising his four boys. He is a gamer, um, that, I mean, he's one of my gaming heroes. Uh, he's the one that, you know, I am, I used to be a gamer back in the day. I'm not a gamer anymore. Um, other than just casual playing on my phone and, and jumping on my Xbox version one that is in our bedroom and, uh, and playing some Halo and stuff like that. But Caleb uh, and his brother-in-law, Michael, are uh, serious gamers, and uh, they like to get together and do a podcast from time to time uh, called Parents Press Play. And he'll explain just a little bit of that. But he's also an iOS geek and, and is actually uh, an apologist, it would seem. I'll, I'll let him defend that in a few moments. But before we get started, I do want to uh, share a free resource with you. Um, it is called Open Church, openchurch.com. And it is a place where you can go and get um, free photography, free stock photography that is geared towards the faith-based community. Um, you know, for, I mean, here's a perfect example, photo of silhouetted man. So when we look at photo of silhouetted man, we see a guy who is, you know, uh, ostensibly contem con contemplative, contemplative, um, so something like this could be used as the basis of some of your your promotional materials or the basis of a new Bible study, uh, men's Bible study, or what have you. But openchurch.com is a place that you can come and get all kinds of stuff like this. Um, they have uh, different uh, license, you know, some of this stuff. And this is actually really important. I want to I show you this. I know it's kind of hard to see right here, but if you take a look at uh, permissions, they have things that have uh, been specifically permitted for commercial use. So use it, uh, do stuff to it, and then, you know, say, put it on the cover of your book and then sell the book. So that's cool. They've got stuff where you have the ability to attribute the source, which is attribution optional. They've got stuff that is remixable. Remixable means take these two photos and put them together in some other way and then use it. So anyway, it's really cool. So just go to openchurch.com and check out the free resources that are made for churches and faith-based organizations. Okay, so I'm going to bring in Mr. Caleb, and let's see here. Caleb, are you with me? I am with you. You are with me. Okay, so Caleb... You know, I, I will say that, you know, we had some technical difficulties, and it took me bringing out my Mac to make this work. Yes, yes, I know. You know can't help me. Yes, I know. Uh, first thing he wanted to try was using his, uh, is it your PlayStation, um, and using Skype and all that on your PlayStation and seeing how that would work? Yeah, I had a uh, an old PlayStation 3 uh, camera that was pretty much unused on that console, and there's some Windows drivers for it, and it just, it made Windows 10 cry. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. Um, yeah, it would, uh, when he was trying to connect and stuff, it was just sitting there like just a little, just a little thing going around the screen like that. I was going, hello, Caleb, uh, Caleb, are you there? Caleb, you know? And, uh, so we finally decided let's hit the Mac and let's, let's not even use Skype. So we went straight to uh, Google Hangouts. And as you can see, he's looking, looking beautiful there on Google Hangouts. Trying to at least. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, tell us about Parents Press Play. Uh, let the folks know uh, what you guys are doing over there, why you're doing it and, and what it's designed for. Yeah, uh, we we've actually kind of expanded it a little bit. We uh, we call it now Parents Press Play and Friends. And what we do is we try to talk about unique and interesting topics uh, throughout the world of gaming, technology, and entertainment. And we do that for people of all ages. So we're you know I'm looking at it from the perspective of a parent, and always through everything when you have kids, you know it just changes your life. And so you know there's definitely a focus out there for 
kind of the uh you know either the hardcore gamer or you know just the kind of um uh, the big comic book nut or anything like that but sure, i kind of look yeah. at it you know what's going to be uh you know what appropriate ages and just try to look for something for all ages and so I come on there as a parent. Uh, we have Michael on there from time to time and some other parents. We also have some people that are non-parents to give that perspective as well. But we're always trying to look for, you know, ages 4 to 97, let's say. Right. And then, of course, things that they can they can share together because, I mean, the, the tastes obviously uh, go back and forth. You know, you and I may want to sit down and, and do some serious zombie killing and stuff you know we wouldn't necessarily want our kids to do it but there would be something that could be a uh, and, and and i'm sure there is there's a game that kind of hits right in the middle where it's not completely blood and gore zombies with eyes falling out but you know those are the bad guys and, and come on son we got to go kill the bad guys and stuff like that right yeah definitely i mean it seems like uh this console generation has been a real push to the core gamer, yeah. which is that, uh, you know, that older gamer who has a lot of disposable income that is, you know, swear words and uh, sure. lots of blood and gore and stuff that's not appropriate for a uh, uh, smaller eyes. Right. And younger eyes. And so, you know, really, I think Nintendo really fills that void. Well, Oh yeah, I, I totally really love the switch. I, I it's, it has the potential to be one of my favorite consoles of all time. And it's something that, you know, Definitely, there's going to be content that you know a younger eye shouldn't see, but there's so much good stuff that I can share my passion of gaming with my kids, and I can see my eight year old now play his first Zelda game and actually beat Breath of the Wild, mm. and then he's back and he's trying to explore these old other Zelda games. So it's just it's it's kind of me reliving my childhood in a way. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Well, hey, thank you, by the way, for for doing this, uh, coming on the show today. This my pleasure. This folks literally was spur of the moment. I, I, earlier this week, I had uh, been planning on a couple of different things, and then I had completely forgot that the Apple announcement was on Tuesday. And so when that came out, I started thinking, okay, I need to address this. I need to, to talk about this. Um, for those of you that have been following me for, I don't know, 10 years, whatever it is, nine years, um, you guys know that I was steeped heavily in the tech industry. Uh, and in tech news and gadget news and all that sort of stuff with Geek Beat TV, uh, and actually on Geek Brief TV with Callie Lewis even before that, um, when I was producing that show for her. Uh, and then we started Geek Beat, and so we were we were hitting everything, every new gadget that came out and stuff. You know, I didn't have to buy gadgets for the the longest time. Um, so uh, you know, we were we were front and center with uh, with all this sort of stuff, and it was always front of mind. And um, and then. Over the years, as I've moved into this space, I'm more into the creating content and doing all that. So my my finger is not on the pulse near as much with um, with the hardware and software that's out there, the latest and greatest, and all this kind of stuff. So when the uh, the new uh, iPhone 8 came out uh, or was announced the other day, uh, it's going to be coming out next week. Uh, and then they they did their one more thing with the iPhone 10 and all that. I said, okay, we got to do this. And then last night, it just sort of struck on me because I had. Um, if you follow me online, folks, um, you've seen me be kind of snarky over the <laughs> the last couple of days and stuff. And I do like to have fun. Um, it, it's funny. I, I tell people, uh, and Caleb and I have had this. We got into a knockdown drag out one time where he was like, you're just a hater and, and you don't like all this sort of stuff. And I'm sitting there going, dude, you don't understand. I'm sitting here typing to you, you know, on a $3,500 Mac Pro. And I've got a 17-inch MacBook Pro sitting over here that costs $2,500. And I've got iPads surrounding me. And, you know, I've got... <laughs> So, so I am a I am a fanboy, as it were, um, but I'm also a realistic one, and I love to be sarcastic and do all this. So I was I had people pinging me in the comments, going, um, "Hey, dude, are you okay? Because this doesn't sound like you." And I was like, "Yeah, actually, it does. <laughs> I just I've been hiding it for the last several years, um, you know, it, so as not to make uh, a a manufacturer mad, so that they would send me stuff. But um, but now I just like to uh, like to have it's fun. A fine line to walk. It is a fine line to walk, and I was uh, I was telling. <laughs> I was telling uh, Caleb, and we and we got like hundreds of comments on this one thread, and uh, it's so funny. So I said, "Well, Caleb, you definitely need to come come be on the show and do this since we've been talking about this all week. You definitely need. Let's just take this conversation to the air and uh, and let's talk about the uh, technical stuff that's coming out and the good and the bad and why we think they did it and what we can do with it and stuff like that. So thank you, uh, my brother, for coming on. L literally talking to me as you were driving home from league night last night. Uh, yeah, I was coming bowling up. last night. Had a good night. Night, so. Yeah, that's good. How'd, that's how'd you do? Yeah, I ended up uh, bowling a 636 series. So if you're not familiar with bowling uh, in a league, you bowl three games. Right. 
So, you know, I, you know, average, you know, two, two 212 plus. game. So yeah, that's, that's cool. That's not bad for me. No, so. that's, I'm lucky if I can get like a 140. That's, that's like, I think, I think I bowled a 150 once and that was, you know, in, in the 35 or 40 years that I've been bowling, that's about, that's about all I've ever done. Takes so, practice and a lot of luck. Yeah. Yeah. So good job on that. Okay. Well, so, so the other day we had, um, we had Apple come out, we had uh, Tim Cook come out and do his, uh, do his thing. Um, they've released some really cool things this week. You want to, you want to give a high level overview of what, uh, of what's coming out? Sure. Let, let's start first with the iOS. That's something everyone's going to be able to get. That's iOS 11. It is the new version of the operating system. Okay. Become an iPhone and iPad. And it is uh, going to be out September 19th. And uh, it definitely is going to be great for uh, all users to upgrade that are able to. Cool. And do we know, do we know what machines, uh, how far back that goes, what devices? Yep. Any, any device that has iOS 10 will be able to do this. Okay. And that's going to be a 64-bit okay. uh, a phone at that point right. or tablet. And then, uh, you know, the watch, watch OS four is coming. I believe that's coming on September 19th as well. And that's going to just increase, uh, it's going to make fitness a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have this heart monitor app on there. That's going to let you look and see where your heart rate is. It's going to, it can notify you if it's elevated and you're not doing anything. So mm -hmm. you could seek medical attention. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the watch, they're kind of moving it towards really, focusing on fitness that's where yeah. it's it's really found its niche it's becoming there. a it's becoming a really useful medical device which is which Definitely. is cool i saw uh just in passing I, I can't i can't remember tell me if i'm wrong on this but i think mm -hmm. one of the things that they're doing is having the ability to have like your heart rate and some of those stats actually be on the front screen now with you um so that you don't have to go to it, it you can it can just be a part of the heads up display um you know along with the time and the weather and all that other kind of stuff Definitely. So they do have different watch faces. They still don't allow developers to make a watch face. Like yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. Wear can, but I don't know why they don't do that, but maybe that'll come in the future. But uh, the heart rate will be visible on some of those uh, watch faces that Apple has. That's cool. And then we also, uh, you know, um, we did get a new watch announcement, Series 3, mm -hmm. that will have LTE capabilities. And then they'll have a model that doesn't have LTE. Okay, so LTE. Yes, um, that's going to be cellular. Cellular, um, right. So when when they first uh, when they first came out with the uh, with you know, like the Pebble, um, which you had uh, have had yes. for many years, um, when they first started coming out, that that's one of the things that we were all hoping for was eventually being able to be like Dick Tracy and you know call you know hey chief we're we're coming in you know we're bringing the guy you know boop 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 and all that sort of stuff and uh, and now we're finally finally there where we actually have uh, and I know people have tried this in the past I remember years ago coming across somebody that had a a cellular radio in in a watch, but it was you know it kind of came and went really quick. It was a proof of concept and it was gone. Uh, and so now they're actually building it in. What's that mean for folks um, that you know are on a monthly plan or or month to month or whatever? I mean, what what are they looking at? Uh, is is it going to be like having to buy a whole new cellular plan and stuff just for your watch? Well, what they're looking at right now is that the watch is going to have to be tied to the same account that your iPhone is on. Okay. And so right now, Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T have all agreed that they're going to allow users to uh, to share the same phone number. Good. And uh, it's looking like those three carriers are also going to give you three months free. Okay. And then after that, it's going to cost you $10 a month to, so, uh, so to it's get not, data on there. It's not it's horrible. Gonna, but... um, you know, I think if you don't have a actual data plan, it's going to give you a gig of data. Mm-hmm. And if you're on unlimited plan, you're just going to have your pool of unlimited data for your watch as well. Okay, that's cool. Um, so, I'm I'm curious. Do you foresee a time? Do you think there is going to be a time where, you know, when they started when they started with the iPod and then got to the iPhone? Remember, we always had to sit down and connect it up to iTunes, whether it was on a Mac sure. or a PC, it didn't matter. You would set it up through iTunes, get it activated, do all this kind of stuff, and then you know when it was time to to get your music and all that sort of stuff, we would sync it, make playlists, and do and you can still do sure. all that, right? Um, but uh, over time, uh, we got to a point where people were buying these and they would never. I, I remember it being an issue. Uh, people saying, I don't have iTunes. I don't have a, you know, a, a Mac or, you know, I haven't, I haven't messed with my computer in years. I just have my computer at work and, you know, stuff like that. And so people, they fixed it so that you could do everything without it ever syncing or docking with a, with a machine. And all. so do we foresee a time? Cause you said, and, and they've said that, 
Uh, it is tied to a cell, the, the cellular number and the account that you already have with Verizon or AT&T or whatever. Do you foresee a time where you and I could just walk in and buy an Apple Watch and, you know, either get online and activate it or activate it through the watch or whatever and never have to have the actual iPhone? It's just this is the iPhone. I, I really think that that is a question that an Android user would ask, and I think it's a good question for them to ask because they don't really have a good smart watch uh, on their platform. I mean, you can argue that uh, Samsung has done a lot better with the watch platform on Android right. than um, Google has with Android Wear. Right. But um, in terms of that, I would answer that. I would lean to no. I would think Apple's going to use uh, the watch platform kind of like iMessage right. when they get on iOS where they're not going to let Android go there. They're going to make you go into their ecosystem. And also, I mean, if you look at the specifics for this watch, if you use LTE exclusively all the time, right. you're only going to get about five hours of battery life. Sure, sure. That makes and sense. so it, with a mix of use, you can get a whole day's worth of use. Right. Um, but I think this is really going to be a, this is really meant for the people who want to, uh, I think specifically it's meant for the people who want to go for a run or run right. down to the beach for a little bit and not bring their phone with them. Right. Yeah. That My wife sense. is one of these people who works out all the time and she is very, very excited about getting a series three watch because uh, she wants to run without her phone. Right. But and still be protected and be able to call someone or be reached if exactly it arises. Well, and, and they, they were talking that uh, you can also stream your, your music library. You can yes. stream to it. Um, you can uh, you can pair your 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 pods uh, you know your Bluetooth headphones you can pair into the now, some into of the that's watch. already available on the watch right now. Cool. Like you can use Bluetooth, you can use your AirPods, or you can use another Bluetooth device to listen to music uh, through your uh, your watch right now, and you can sync it with uh, uh, music from Apple Music. And as far as streaming it through your watch, you know that would definitely be possible with LTE, but it's only going to be Apple Music. You're okay. not going to have the option for Spotify on that. Okay, well that uh, <laughs> that's that's kind of the way they uh, they they do. They want everything to be inside their ecosystem, and that's you know we've argued back and forth. You and I have, and other people. I've had this conversation a million times. One of the great things about Apple is that they control the ecosystem and the supply chain and the software and all this kind of stuff, which makes for more security. Um, which makes for better performance because they write, you know, they have, we've got these three chips. And so when you write your software, you're going to write to the instruction sets on these three chips. You can optimize, you can do, that's, that's why everything developers. works so well. Um, but part of the problem is that you do get locked into that ecosystem. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the kind of guy that is the best tool for the job. That's what I want. So if, you know, if, if I if I get better pricing through Spotify, I want to use Spotify as my streaming. Th I really don't care. I will rip all my CDs and rip all my DVDs and all that sort of stuff and put them into iTunes and then access them, you know, through through my iOS devices and such. But even even that I don't do. I mean, I mean, I do throw the, the CDs and stuff like that, but I don't I don't add I don't. I don't have Apple TV here at the house. I'm a Roku guy and, and you know, Android TV and uh, or, or Google TV and stuff like that. So, um, you know, for me, the best tool for the device for media aggregation and stuff is a Plex server. So I've got an old MacBook sitting over here that has uh, a Drobo connected to it where I've taken all of my discs and, and home movies and audio and video and all that sort of stuff. I've even, I've even been known to take a VHS tape and transfer it, you know, into my computer and clean it up a little bit and drop it over there. So, wow. you know, all the, I know, um, all that, but it's the best tool for the job. So Plex is amazing. Yeah. Plex, I yeah. I got you onto Plex. So yeah, Plex is, Plex is the, is, is extremely cool, but I don't, I understand why they do it for two reasons. They want the money. They want you buying and, and paying their streaming service. And I understand that completely and all that, but, um, I, I really hope that that some of that changes over time because I think I think you tend to alienate people. I have no problem not ever getting an Apple Watch simply because I'm locked into this core set of stuff, you know? 
And I think it will open up a little bit eventually. Now, as far as uh, opening it up to not tether to an iPhone, mm-hmm. I think we're a long ways from that because okay. I think Apple wants to definitely use that to keep people in their ecosystem. But in terms of like Spotify and other uh, app makers like that, I think it's possible in the future that, that they'll open it up more because they have done a lot more with iOS in terms of I have some apps now that'll open up a link in Chrome instead of Safari. Right. Uh, and I can open up uh, links into uh, Google Maps instead of Apple Maps. Right. Apple Maps is terrible. Yeah, Apple Maps so, is horrible. But I can't. Yeah, if you want to die? Use Apple Maps to get Google Map directions <laughs> right. like I can uh, Apple Maps. Right. And um, to their credit, um, as as the ecosystem inside like Apple TV has started to flourish and all that. They have opened it up and let the guys over at Plex last year, I guess it was, was when they announced uh, Plex was available. Maybe it was a year, a year before um, where uh, the Plex app is available for Apple TV and all that. So you do have that infrastructure in your house already. Now this is another device that can sit right alongside your Roku and your Google TV and your, you know, your, your Roku TV and all this kind of stuff. You can drop this in the kitchen and, you know, continue on and have access to even more stuff, which is really cool. Let's talk for a sec. Yeah. Um, about the uh, about the Apple TV because um, I am I'm I'm in the in, in the process of um, beginning to look at how I want to upgrade our entertainment system and and do all that and the next TV we get is probably going to be one of those uh, Roku 4K TVs uh, TCL is making that is just I mean they've hit a sweet spot with the price and the value the TCL's kind of become the Vizio uh, now you know where oh, wow. where um, where it's not just you know a, a bunch of crap they've thrown together and slapped a low price on. There's actually really good value and really good quality and all that. And having a complete Roku interface built in, you know, it, it is really cool. So I'm actually looking at stuff like that. And now uh, with the 4K Roku boxes that are out there, and now Apple TV doing that, uh, it looks like it looks like they can be a serious contender again in the high quality uh, streaming and content delivery. Well, let's talk about Apple TV then, because definitely uh, I'm I'm an Apple TV user primarily now. I, I did um, use a Fire TV stick several years ago, right? And I believe there's a Roku three yeah. that I use. I've got a Fire I've got a Fire stick in our bedroom, and I love it. I liked it, but I love the Apple TV. Mm. Um, the the Fire TV stick was just slow and sluggish, and they may have made improvements since I purchased that one. And then the I found the same thing with the Roku three. It was just slow and sluggish. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Roku 3, that, that's an older product, I understand, so I, I'm not trying to judge what they're doing now. I still have but, a Roku 1 on my set in the uh, in the garage. Okay. Yeah. I You know, a, Apple TV, the first thing about it is, you know, there is a non-4K and a 4K version. Mm-hmm. The 4K version is coming out uh, September 22nd. And it's, uh, you know, it's a little expensive compared to a 4K that uh, Roku has what's, and what's the price Amazon on it? has. Because they're right, right around $100. Okay. And uh, Am and um, Apple is going to sell the 4K Apple TV uh, starting at 179 for the 32 gigabytes and mm-hmm. 199 for the 64 gigabytes. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not sure in terms of what feature set Roku and uh, Amazon provide with their 4K uh, boxes, but uh, Apple is using both HDR10, which is the open HDR standard, right? As well as Dolby Vision HDR, right? People who like HDR and and are in that world tend to lean towards the Dolby Vision, right. although there is a cost for uh, television makers to put that in. Yeah, but those are the two standards that are vying for dominance right now. And Apple will support both of those. So it seems like no matter which way the market goes, they'll they'll be supporting that. And uh, I mean, if you haven't seen a uh, 4K HDR, it's just I mean, the colors are just absolutely stunning. Yeah, it's it- a it's a bigger jump than just 4K. Oh, sure, it definitely is. Um, and just just to, to clarify, uh, wow. I know a lot a lot of us um, have been playing with uh, HDR photography for years. Uh, my buddy Trey Ratcliffe um, is is like the premier high dynamic range photographer like on the planet, and um, he's the I one that, that too. yeah, and he he he's the one that brought brought HDR to the masses basically with um, with his uh, his course and his. Uh, his ebooks and stuff like that. Um, but one of the things that that I hear a lot of people complain about with HDR is that oh, it just looks hyper real. It just looks so. It, it looks beyond that. And we've all seen it. We've all seen the the picture of the you know the 
the old uh, ratted out, um, you know, pickup truck sitting in a field and, you know, a sunset back there and everything's just like hyper dimensional. And it's just it, it looks it it looks fake. It, it's gone so much. Um, and that is not the case when you're talking about HDR video. We're simply talking about more accurate, proper color representation, uh, a wider gamut palette. We're talking the the ability to to see the colors and see the uh, but between the 4K resolution and the richness and the sharpness of that image, and and the HDR, whether it's the Atmos or the HDR10 spec, um, being able to see the colors represented as accurately as possible from the time that they were captured or as close to when you and I walk outside and we take a look at the rose bush and see it, you know, kind of, kind of moving in the, in the breeze and stuff. We're seeing as close to what our eyes, average eyes are picking up, um, which is really cool. And it's stunning. And I know we have, uh, we recently, uh, 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 got a direct TV service here at the house and we have the 4k uh, mm -hmm. via some RVU enabled televisions, which is basically a 4k television that has a direct TV box built in. Oh, cool. These are from, these are from LG. And so anyway, uh, the twins were upset. They're, they're eating uh, some breakfast and drinking milk. And we turned on um, one of the 4k documentaries. Cause that's about all that's in 4k on direct TV <laughs> right, right now. Yeah. And so we're at a coral reef or something and they saw the ocean and it was like they were there. They were looking at the fish. They, yeah. they felt like they were there. And yeah. I mean, it captures even a, I mean, it, it may not take much to capture a two year old, but they were upset. And then they saw like, wow, I'm, I'm at the beach or yeah, I'm, I'm in the ocean now. It, it, it's really stunning. And they're not even using HDR yet. Right. Right. So, but it, you know, back on the, the Apple TV though, yes. uh, they do have another model that starts at 149, which is the fourth, just the regular fourth gen Apple TV. And one neat thing about the Apple TV is that, you know, I know Roku and Amazon have done this for a while, but the apps, it, they've opened it up for apps. And that's why Plex is able to, right. to make an application. And, you know, if you can make, if you can write an app for iOS, then you can write an app for TV OS as well. Right. And, and that, that is, that's, that's how, that's where I want to tie this in specifically for the church market, because as I'm uh, as I'm teaching you guys how to live stream and do all that, as as we move on, we're going to be learning how to uh, to to create apps and stuff for Apple TV, for Roku, and all that. We want to, um, you know, our goal is to help change lives. So to get out there and master and exploit all these technologies. So having the ability to write an app for your church that goes out to the uh, to the Apple TV, to iOS devices, to uh, they have watch integration that can be done on a Roku box or, you know, whatever the flavor of the month is out there, being able to write and publish to that gives you a much broader reach um, churches and gives you the ability to get that message out for whether it's live streaming, whether it is archival, whether it is a part of your digital church strategy where you have multiple campuses and uh, remote uh, home groups and things like that that you're feeding content to. That's what these devices can help you do. And uh, the ability to write apps to that uh, is a huge thing. I also like the ability to be able to produce 4K content and get that 4K content streamed out there as well. That is that that's really cool. A lot of churches main streaming in 4K is not quite there yet. Okay, um, I I think YouTube can receive it. I know. I mean, we're still streaming 720 over to um, over to Facebook Live, uh, and for the foreseeable future, that that's all that, that there's going to be. But over time, um, that's going to be opening up, and we're it's going to become more efficient for us to be able to live stream 4K. Uh, if but, I could jump in there, Apple please. talked about a new video codec mm. at, at back at WWDC in June, which is their developer conference. Yeah. And they're talking about being able to uh, deliver a 4K on a much less bandwidth. Uh, so, is it a is it the H.265 spec? Are yes, they... that, that's what it was. Yeah. Okay. So all that's going to be available. So that's uh, that's Apple TV. Um, tell yeah, me. Let's. Tell let's. Me. Uh, uh, so we talked about the watch. We talked about Apple TV. Yes. Uh, let's. Should we talk about some iPhones? Yes, we should. So they announced the iPhone 8 and the 8 Plus. Uh, tell me tell me why you need to get one of those instead of uh, keeping your 7. You know, there's there's only a few reasons why you want to upgrade. I mean, they they updated the case a little bit, so it's a glass back and and 
and so it's a little bit different design. But still, they're doing the thing with the iPhone 8 that they did with the 7 that I don't like, and that's where they're putting a better camera mm -hmm. into the Plus line. Right. And in addition to that, you're also getting uh, a much better battery life. And so uh, the the is it just because you have you have a physically larger battery in there, or are they doing something with the guts to make it more efficient? No, it, it's a bigger battery, okay, just because they have more room. Sure. So they're putting they're just filling it up with more battery. Right. And uh, but the uh, the camera is a it's a dual lens system. Yeah, you, know, you get your telephoto, and so you can zoom out, and uh, and then you also have this portrait mode they added last year, and and this year what they're doing to that is they're adding a portrait lighting mode. Yeah, that's and cool. So this, this is really awesome. I mean, in real time, you're going to be able to, you know, take your phone and go into portrait mode. And then in real time, you're going to be able to take your subject and do all these really cool lighting effects. And the phone is going to save everything. So if you want to change that lighting effect later, you can. Right. So so we can we can kind of they're doing this because they have the two cameras, which is which is cool on the on the plus. If you guys don't know, if you don't have a plus, um, you know, starting with. With the seven, I think it was they started doing the dual cameras. Is that right? Or did they do, did they do yeah, that on the, six? the uh the seven? Okay, with so the seven plus. on the seven plus, they put two cameras on there. They got a wide angle and a telephoto camera, so you can jump jump back and forth. You don't have to do a digital zoom, you know, for the for the telephoto. You've actually got a telephoto lens on there, and you just it, I mean kind of swap over to it and it's telephoto, or swap back over the other, and you get a nice wide angle. But because of that, it it allows you to actually get depth readings which is cool so you can you can be using the wide angle and and taking a picture but then you're also using the data that is coming in through the telephoto to read all the stuff that's going on beyond where your subject is which is cool uh, and that's how you're able to get like a really nice bokeh effect when you take a picture and the background is kind of blurry it's like that other camera is kind of working to 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 do stuff with the part of the image that is uh, is off in the background so that's really cool. Now they're going to be using that to read the lighting in the room and absorb all this information um, about the lighting values and the IRE values and stuff that are that are in the room and and where in, and because it's smart, it can say this is where the face is and here's how the light is playing on it. Now if we take this light and 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 get all this data and then start manipulating this data later, we can in essence effect what would happen if we moved the light closer or if we took the light farther away or if we moved the light around to the side or to the to the back of the person etc which is really cool so think of it like like raw okay so if you're if you've got a nice if you got a nice um dslr or a mirrorless camera that allows you to shoot in raw mode which is where you know you get like a 60 gig uh, 60 megabyte per per image picture versus like a five megabyte per <laughs> image jpeg right what the raw does is it takes in everything that that sensor is picking up all that information is all getting recorded and then later you can develop based on that information so when you do a jpeg it says um here's all this stuff however we got to save file size so take all this light information and all this color information and get it out of the way and just we're only going to have what they're the average eye can see, and that's where you get a JPEG. Whereas with RAW, you take all that in. So now we're getting like this RAW to the 10th power, I guess, with um, with the the lighting and stuff that you can do. And you're able to do this all on a device this size, which... They didn't talk about file size, but I'm assuming it's not going to take up that much more room. I, I um, wouldn't I wouldn't think so. I mean, it's you're you're basically going to be getting it out as a JPEG, I guess, or, or maybe they'll allow you to have a, have a RAW file. I don't know if they're actually allowing you to be able to to, to shoot raw i, I um, want to say i remember them saying that there's going to be a different file format for these okay. photos I, I i don't remember that cool. specifically but you we also have to remember this is going to launch with the with the new phones and it's going to be beta so they could right. be improving how this works over time i would i would think so once yeah they can only they can only test it so much themselves once they get it out there and really get it deployed and and get in a lot of different hands then they'll i'm sure they'll be tweaking a lot of stuff, but it, it is, you know, for churches that budgets, I mean, that's something that, that we all have to deal with, you know, with the media team and, and you can, you know, here's $3,000. So now, you know, buy, you know, that's what you have to buy cameras with. So what do you do? Do you buy, you know, do you buy six $500 cameras or, or, you know, what do you do? This opens up the ability for, 
for uh, and, and the ability's been there, but this just enhances the ability for like your media volunteers that have an iPhone. This can contribute to the content generation for the media ministry. Whether you know you don't have to have a DSLR, you can go around and shoot shoot images with your your eight plus. Um, in the in the Sunday school rooms or, or during the Bible study, doing youth events and stuff like that, you can do your staff portraits. I'm, I'm it, one of us at our church is going to have an eight plus, and so I'm going to do staff portraits with this and just see how well. The, do we hire somebody to come in now and go shoot all these? No, we don't have to. We can actually do this um, with what we have in in our back pockets, which is really exciting. Now they also came out with the the X. <laughs> Yeah, one other thing I want to say about the eight yes. and the eight plus is it does shoot 4K video at 60 frames per second. Yes, which is which is really awesome. And if yes. you want that slow motion video, it'll do 1080p at 240 frames per right. second, which is double what yeah, the yeah, seven plus. It's did. been it's been 120. So you can do some of those really cool. I shot a um, uh, I grabbed I've got a, a I still have a 2015 Moto X Pure Edition that shoots 4K, and I I, I love this. Um, and, I, I shot stuff at one of our uh, events uh, a few weeks ago uh, where we had like water slides and, and bounce houses and all that kind of stuff. And so I shot some slow motion stuff uh, and it's, it's really cool being able to do it at 120 frames a second. Now 240, you can, you can, you can get some seriously, some seriously cool, you know, super slow motion kind of stuff. I mean, when they do some super slow motion in, in movies, uh, they're doing stuff at 240 frames a second. Now they also are able to do stuff at a thousand or two thousand frames a second, which is amazing. Uh, and and eventually, folks, I'm telling you, that's going to be available to you and I. Maybe not on our phones, but uh, in some of our consumer devices and stuff, where we can actually get to the point where we're shooting 580 or you know a thousand frames a second. That is going to come eventually. Uh, it's encouraging that with a phone now <laughs> you're going to be able to do 240 frames a second. Um, Why'd they do the 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 eight when they were going to be releasing the the ten? You know, I this is a question that I was asking the entire time. Um, you know, I really don't like. You know, I I love Apple. I use their products. Uh, I agree with them on a lot of things. But you know, I'll definitely point out when I think they're making mistakes. Okay. And one thing that I think they've made a mistake with on their line of phones is when they basically separated this this regular phone and the Plus phone. Okay. And on the Plus phone, they made the camera that much better. Right. It made the other version less appealing mm-hmm. and less desirable. And so I think they started this trend of having a, a better and best. And now they've done a better, good, better best, and best, great version. Yeah, good, better, and best, yeah. I think part of this, they also increased the price slightly over the last generation. Uh, the 8 starts at 699 where the 7 started at 649 The 8 Plus is 799 when it was 769 mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. the 8 plus uh, 799 the 7 plus was 769 and these are the 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 lowest models which are the 64 gig models that's all, right. they're 64- previously they were 32 gigabytes right. so they did upgrade the storage to 64 sure. but you're kind of paying for it in a way yeah. if you look at the price oh, sure. increase uh, but probably 64 is probably the minimum what i think you'd probably want on a phone anyway if you're going to be shooting 4k yeah definitely and then with the 10 you know they're they're starting that phone out the sixty four gigabyte for nine ninety nine and the two fifty six at eleven forty nine gigabyte yeah. version. Yeah, and so uh, you know I think that's a nice thirteen inch MacBook Pro. I, exactly. I mean it's it's an expensive expensive phone, but I, I wonder part of partially they did this because people expected a seven S version of the phones, right. which is really what the eight is. And they did this to kind of make it a little more expensive, and then they kept the older one at a little cheaper price. So they have phones starting at three forty nine and going all the way over to eleven forty nine. If they kind of uh, were able to stop the sticker shock a little bit yeah. of just releasing a, an iPhone ten that was a thousand dollars, I I mean I could see Apple people going nuts like, wh- why are you doing a thousand dollar phone? I'm not paying that. Right. They say, well, we have a phone for you then. It's six ninety nine. Right. Um, to me, if I think if Steve Jobs was there, he would have said. No, we get this phone out at eight ninety nine, or we, right. we cut, cut some, uh, not necessarily cut corners, but get it to where this is. No, we're just releasing this one phone. Right. They're going to buy this or not have one. Right. <laughs> well, kind of- when he when he, you know, he was fired back in the late eighties or at, right at the beginning of the early nineties, and he went and started Pixar, and then he came back, and everything got better. But I remember those days. This is when I was working at Microsoft and at, at Dell. 
Uh, and down in Austin, there was a company called PowerPC that was making clones, Mac clones and stuff. And all this stuff was starting to happen in that it, 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 the the market was getting desaturated and the quality levels of, of uh, Apple, quote unquote, products and all that was all, you know, really bad. And then when Steve Jobs came in, um, he said, OK, we're not licensing licensing this out to anybody. All that stuff is going away. We're going to make this, this and this. And we're streamlining. And then when they came out with the iPods, we're making this. And the only difference in models is um, the size. And then now it was the size and color. And that's OK. And and then, you know, they made the Nano and they made a, you know, a couple of different versions to fit a different need out there. But since he's passed away, they're... I mean, there's all these different flavors, all these different things. There's, uh, you know, they're getting back to tons of SKU numbers out there yes. and stuff. And I think it's interesting because Steve, uh, not uh, Tim Cook, uh, originally came as as a uh, supply chain guy, and you know he was, you know, he was in charge of SKUs and he was doing all this sort of stuff. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting. Are do you think now? And as I understand, they have, um, they have issues with acquiring what they need for the tin. So there's chip issues, there's glass issues, all that sort of stuff. So we're talking, uh, there will be, if this thing is really selling the way they're hoping it's going to sell and stuff, there's going to be a backlog. Yeah. I think this is going to be a really hard phone to get, uh, no matter how many they make, they're going to sell out on October 27th when they do the pre-orders, they may keep a few to have a few in the stores. They're going to sell out of these. This is going to be the a very hot phone this year. Now, why do it's, I why do I want this instead of an eight or an eight plus? I really think that this is the most desirable iPhone that's ever been created. Uh, for me, part of that comes with the screen. This is using what they're calling the Super Retina display. Uh, that is, you know, Apple says that this is the first OLED type screen they could use because. It's, you know, it's going to have a 1 million to 1 contrast ratio. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Which is, you know, something they weren't able to do on the retina screen. Right. And, you know, to me, it starts with that, and it's it's a bezel-less um, uh, display there. So you have screen from edge to edge. Right. And doing that, they got rid of the home button. So it's a radical departure for the iPhone. It's a it's a uh, different design. They do have this notch area at the top. That well, hang on. You said you said it's bezel-less and stuff that, you know, like this. I mean, this is 2015 and it's all, I mean, there's the, the only part on the edge is, is what you need to be able to hold it. And, and, you know, when you take a look at the, the, the Samsung edge ones and stuff, it actually wraps around. So why is this, why is that new? Well, I mean, it, you do uh, have um, more space at the top that Apple choose to have the screen go up with. I right. mean, I'm not saying that, with Apple, I mean, let's let's. This is know. not revolutionary, folks. Uh, no, but what Apple does that's different than every company is, you know, and Steve Jobs says, "What is it? A uh, um, good artist copy, great artist steal." Yeah, right. It, 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 so basically, what they do is they take ideas that are out there and they make them uh, so good that people fall in love with it, and they it makes people think that they invented it. <laughs> right. <laughs> To the point where you know they're gonna people are gonna think Apple invented wireless charging. They're gonna think Apple yeah. invented. This. Yeah, I've been wireless charging for five years, folks. <laughs> and they yeah. announced it, and it's revolutionary. And I mean, it, there's and this and key not, technology. What Apple does is package it up in a way <laughs> and, and and create things in a way where it just works well. Hmm. Now, I had some issues like uh, you know uh, the Note Five. I I bought one of Samsung's fast chargers. Yeah. And my phone after about three months because I switched to Android for about a 14 month period and right. it would actually quit charging after 30 minutes. Mm. Nobody, no one could figure out. We did lots of swaps and stuff, but I, I found that outside of the Apple world, things just always didn't work. Um, now this is a radical departure for iPhone may not necessarily be, you know, there's the note eight out there. Um, but this is a radical departure for iOS that this is where Apple is going with their future, their phones. And and part of that also is how they're integrating a, a technology they're calling face ID. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah. This is, this is using uh, this notch area on the, uh, on the uh, iPhone 10, which I, I won't call it the X. I'll call it the 10. <laughs> uh, they Fan have boy. all these different cameras and sensors up there. And it is actually, when you open up your phone, you're going to hold up your phone. 
and you're going to look around. It's going to show you what to do. It's going to map your face. Right. Uh, they have a chip in there that's handling that, and it's going to learn what your face is. So if you put a hat on, uh, you know, I recently shaved off my beard. Right. It would see that and still know it's me. Right. Uh, if I uh, put glasses on, by you know, if uh, my wife has makeup on one day and doesn't the next day, it's going to see who she is. Uh, and they're saying that you know that's going to be a very hard thing to spoof. They're saying you cannot use a picture, like you can on the Samsung phones. Right. You're not going to be able to. They got like Hollywood level makeup artists to make a mask of someone. Right. That's not going to work. The other thing is you actually have to actively look at the phone. If you're if you have your eyes closed, you're not looking at the phone. Right. It won't unlock. And when you look at it, it's going to just unlock. And then you swipe up and use your phone. This is what's going to uh, allow people to continue to use Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to be authenticated with your face. So if there's an app that you use that you has Touch ID enabled already, it's going to use the Face ID. Mm -hmm. And I think the way Apple, you know, Apple did not invent fingerprint uh, scanners. Right. But Apple made that popular. It, it brought it in to the light where people were comfortable using it, kind of made it mainstream. Mm -hmm. I think although face scanning is not new, Apple has done this so well. I mean, from what I've seen, they've done it so well. Um, I really think that this is going to lead and usher in a, a, a new generation of phones that are going to be copying this feature eventually. Sure, sure. And this is how we're going to be uh, opening our phones in the future from everyone. Okay, so it seems it seems really convenient. It seems really cool and all this. But in another thread last night, I was talking with um, uh, a friend of mine that's a uh, <laughs> funny. He's a comedy writer out in uh, Hollywood. Um but he uh, he brought up something that uh, I hadn't really thought about. But now that I think about it, um, it's one of these things where, you know, I will not on purpose ever use touch ID, my fingerprint or uh, my face or any other biometric to unlock one of my devices. And it's it's because of a liberty concern that I have. Um, okay. The courts have said that um, they cannot take Caleb and force you to give them the six digit code to unlock your phone, which is why we've had cases where they've, you know, like a couple of the, was, was, uh, one of the, the, the terrorists was it, uh, Santa, well, not Santa Barbara, where I think it might've been. Yeah. And San they wanted his passcode and yeah, Apple and Apple would wouldn't do it. Yeah. So let, there was let them hack it. Right. Exactly. Um, so eventually they were able to, to, to cut into it and get it and all that. But, um, the, the the thing is is that sitting there you know in a in a detention center they can't say you have to give us this phone they you know it, it's a yeah, you I understand can't, what you're saying they can't now, you can't that, relinquish uh, things Apple from does, your brain but your biometrics they can they can take your finger and stick it on there they can hold it up to your face um I guess they could clockwork orange your eyes you know to yeah. to, to do it and stuff and you know uh Scoble uh, Robert Scoble uh, is a technologist um, and uh, someone I've met several times over the years. He uh, he he put in there. He said, you know, well, if you aren't a criminal, you know, you really don't have to worry about something like that. And I said, that's that's not the point. The point is not I'm going to be bad and this helps me be bad. And yeah, sure. There's guys out there that are like that. OK, that's fine. But that's not why we have a constitution. That's not why we have a Bill of Rights. It's so that. Someone who is bad and has a lot of power can't force right. me to hold my eyes open and unlock my phone and steal my information or or fake information and frame me and doing stuff like that. So I, I really have concerns where we're, we're going to give away – we're going to continue to give away our liberty and stuff for uh, the sake of convenience, and I don't like that. So I'm going to fight that tooth and nail. I understand that. I definitely do because I'm. I'm definitely. I. I can hear those concerns, and I have those, especially uh, as a Christian. Yeah. Um. You know, we think of ourselves as. Uh, you know, it's very convenient to be a Christian in, in the Western. Um, sure. World most of the time. Right. But you know, definitely there are de definitely varying degrees of persecution, and I think uh, you know it could get worse for Christians. Right. It, um, where it's, it's happening in other countries fewer fewer in, in America today, right. especially. And it's happening in other countries where they are being forced to, uh, you know, to sign documents. They're being forced to admit they're they're you know being beheaded, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I can see this happening a lot if, if uh, uh, in now, other what, countries. What I would say about what Apple has done, and I'm not sure how Samsung or other companies would handle this, but on the Touch ID phones, I know you can hit a button so many times and it disables Touch ID where you have to use your uh, password to get into it. Right. 
I think there's going to be that same type of button uh, where you're going to hit the, uh, I don't think they call it the, the power button. I forgot what they call the side button now on the, uh, yeah, that's the new home button. <laughs> the, yeah. Basically it's the new home button. You're going to be able to tap that so many times to disable face ID. But also another thing is if someone does unlock your phone, they, they force you to unlock it. If they plug that into a computer, Apple requires that to be authenticated again. Oh, okay. Uh, this is something I, I heard today. I was uh, listening to some other tech shows about this very subject. But, you know, it is, it is uh, you know, it's also you have to trust the company that you're giving this information to. I mean, when we post stuff on Facebook, when we share right. our lives, we have to trust the companies that we give all this information to. Right. That they're not going to use it for evil. I mean, Apple says that when you do touch ID or you do a face scan, that that stays locally on the phone. Right. Um, so at some point you're going to have to make a choice if, if what you're comfortable, comfortable doing, I think the line will be drawn for me. If ever, anyone ever tried to insert some type of a computer chip in my body. Yeah, I agree. That, that's kind of the line I draw. I say, okay, no, I'm, I don't care if what, what I get out of that. I'm not doing that. Right. That's, that's kind of where I stop, but I definitely do understand the privacy concerns on that. Yeah. Well, and the good thing that I've seen about Apple, and Apple has been consistent in this, at least publicly, I don't know what's happened behind the scenes, but at least publicly they've been consistent on this, that encryption is very important to them, that um, the not relinquishing this information and, and not giving back doors and doing all that kind of stuff, and they fought tooth and nail on that. Uh, and I hope that they would continue to do that. Now, it's one thing to do that in the United States. It's another thing to uh, have to do this with China, who is a partner of theirs. Um, or some of these other countries that do not have the human rights uh, and civil liberties uh, that we do. Uh, those are, I mean, good Lord, North Korea. I mean, all, I mean, th that's a that's a complete non-issue over there. There's no such thing as civil liberties and human rights. So, um, the good thing is, is that at least for the Western world, um, they're really good about protecting all that information. But over time, things change. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, is there anything else, Caleb, as far as uh, product announcements that they did? Or, or I, I know they, they sneaked in some price updates for the iPad Pros and stuff. Do you think, um, do you think that the iPad Pro is, uh, uh, is something that is going to continue being developed? Do you think the iPad itself is going to go away and it's only going to be iPad Pros over? I mean, what do you what do you think? We're moving that way. I think Apple is kind of uh, doing a similar strategy with the iPads that they're doing with the phones now, mm -hmm. where you have, uh, you know, you have iPhones that start at 349, mm -hmm. that the C model with a smaller screen that they don't do as much. You know, they have an iPad in that similar price range. Right. I think reach 29. I, I'm, I'm not sure the exact price on that, but which is great for, you know, a, a kid or whatever you have that you need to stream videos sure. and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, the iPad pro, I think is something special. I really think that that is a glimpse of the future. I think is when we think of a desktop or a laptop, uh, computer to get work done, I think we're moving away from that. I think eventually we may even plug a phone or a tablet into some type of dock that's going to sure. go on a screen and yeah. be a full computer. And when you take it away, it's going to be the mobile version of it. Right. Not there now. But I, I think that uh, what Apple's doing with uh, as far as their, uh, you know, I understand other people have integrated keyboards and stuff. But, you know, you have your convertibles. Right. Um, and, you know, Microsoft's done it with the Surface as well. And they've Google's done it very well with the Surface, with the, with the, the higher end Surface Pro and stuff. It's uh, it seems to be really good execution on that. Yeah, definitely. And, and so I think Apple is, you know, they're doing a different route because they're not they're not integrating OS or Mac OS now with iOS. They're two separate things. But, uh, you know, I really think that the iPad Pro is going to be something that in a few years, we're going to be able to do a lot of everything we normally do on a computer. Right. You're going to be able to edit. You're going to be able to record. You're going to be able to, I think, especially churches will be able to almost use that exclusively as a computer yeah. for even their staff. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we're moving to. And, you know, for me, I, I love taking an, an iPad with a keyboard to take notes in church. To oh, I know. Bible apps. Oh yeah, I know. Um, Listen, I'm, I'll tell you that this guy would sit behind me, and if it wasn't if it wasn't his iPad with a keyboard, um, uh, in like a little keyboard case, it was his Chromebook, and he and his wife both would sit there right behind us the whole time, and just take. I mean, it was like a stenographer sitting back there taking notes and everything. <laughs> so yeah. I can I can vouch for this, folks. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy doing that. I know uh, over at Denton Bible Church. 
uh, Tommy Nelson's the pastor over there, and he's uh, a little bit scared of technology, you know. As uh, some, <laughs> we'll fix you know, him. It's a generational thing. Yeah, let's get and, him. In, uh, let's get him in church training you know, academy. Like, we'll fix what, him. What movie are you watching on there? No, I'm I'm actually taking notes and and <laughs> <laughs> and following along with you just in different translations. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I actually right, got I the think, stream we'll running in a little window. The, the iPad. I think uh, on the iPhone. I think it's more about this is the future of where it's going. Yeah. Now the question is: Do you is it worth a thousand dollars for you to get that future now? I think for me who likes to live on the bleeding edge, the mm-hmm. answer is yes. But if you are coming from like an older phone, the eight could be a good upgrade if you need the camera, or you could save a few dollars and just go to the seven. Right. Yeah. And 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 I'll tell you, folks, uh, just price conscious, folks. I'm a I'm a price conscious. I have a very hard time paying six or seven hundred dollars for a phone that's that's one of the reasons that i i got the moto x pure uh i've i've thoroughly enjoyed android i, I really like uh, android i love the customization that you can do and i can make this mine and this was one of the first ones that um that was a huge commercial success and they say we're not going to muck it up with a ton of carrier specific software and bloatware and stuff like think about what happens when you buy a dell you buy a dell pc you can now thankfully when i was working there i had to help people uninstall all this crap but um you can now say i don't want any of this stuff i want windows that's it. And you know what? I'm buying this printer to go along with it. So go ahead and put the drivers on there. And that's about it. Um, and so when I got this, it was just, it's Android. And there are two or three um, Motorola specific apps on here that work with the thing, the features that are built into the phone, the health features or something like that. But there's none of that, no Verizon this and NFL that and all this other garbage. So. So, on AT&T, when I switched over to the Note 5, I did that in the Nexus 6P. Uh-huh. What I found on AT&T, and I don't know if they've changed this policy or not, but if you did not have a carrier-specific phone, the only one that you could really do was an iPhone. Hmm. But if you had any other phone that you were bringing on their network, they didn't give you features like voice over LTE. Hmm. Right. And and that was a, a huge drawback, uh, just not having that. I mean, it was nice having like Nexus 6P back then because it was pure Android. Right. But it was really bad because I – my phone was crippled on the AT&T network. Yeah, on on their network that you bought to connect to their network. Exactly. And they're like, yeah, we don't support that. You need to buy one of our specific phones. Like, you need to buy a, a branded phone that's going to have all of our bloatware on it, basically. Right, exactly. And and let me tell you, folks, don't, don't be under don't any, any, any kind of uh, delusions that they're doing this for your benefit. What they're doing it for is because they have contracts with these companies that make this crap, uh, sorry, this software, and for every install, they get a piece of the action. That's how this works. That's why we were doing it at Dell. That's why we were doing it at uh, these other companies. Oh, definitely when you guys are looking at phones, you know, I, I tend to now be in the iOS world. You know, I probably would never have the guts to give Android another try. I'm just too invested again. But, you know, make look at these things. These are these are important features to make sure that you're not getting uh, locked into a phone that's not going to get updates. Right. That is going to have all this bloatware on there, and that will ruin your battery life and, and ruin the performance of a phone. Yeah. Yeah, it will. And um, I am of the opinion, uh, and, and I know you, you don't do this. I know you basically lease your phones, and you get the latest and greatest uh, each year and stuff. And yeah. And and there's you know if you're if you do want to be on the bleeding edge and you do want to always have the latest and greatest technology look I do that with my software okay so I do that with the um, with the Adobe suite instead of spending sixteen hundred dollars for the the master package and that's it you know which is what we had to do you know until five six seven years ago however long it's been they they've done the subscriptions um, now you know I pay forty nine dollars a month or whatever the the price is. And um, it's always updated, and I get the latest stuff. So I understand doing that, but it's also what I use to make this content for you guys. And you know, it's 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 my tool that you know. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, a a lumberjack, you know, paying to have his blade sharpened. You know, you do that so that you can continue to cut down trees, so you can continue to put food on the table. So I understand that. When it comes to phones, you know, I may tend to do that. Um, if I'm going to be using an iPhone 10 to create a bunch of content and training stuff and all that to teach other people how to use these things, you know, for Church Training Academy, I may do the thing where you pay 20 bucks or 50 bucks a month or whatever to uh, to basically lease it and pay it out over time. Um, but I'm telling you, um, don't 
if if you can, if you're in a position, I would always suggest that you get an unlocked so that you can go back and forth to the carrier that you want. Um, sure. Because they have, they change over time. They change their offerings. Right now, it seems like the best offering that, uh, that at least the last time I looked, is like at, at T-Mobile, where, you know, you get at one price per phone, you know, or you get two or three phones or four phones bundled, and it's $150 a month or 160 or something like that, and it's all unlimited this and unlimited that and no caps and all that sort of stuff, and they do that, and maybe they're the best game in town for the next year and a half, you know, and then halfway through, it's like, great, Verizon is doing something that's absolutely amazing. I want to go to Verizon. So, unlocked phones, if, you know, you, you buy them outright, and but you end up with the most flexibility. And then Apple does have a payment plan that uh, allows you to actually get an unlocked phone. Oh, they so do you themselves. Can get locked in to a specific carrier, or you can do an unlocked phone, which is their Apple SIM. Uh-huh. Um, so you can go that right route with Apple. Now, one thing you have to know, if you do an Apple payment plan, which is a monthly plan, you're basically paying 0% interest for the phone over two years. Okay. If you get one with the ability for you to upgrade after making 12 payments, mm-hmm. uh, you do have to pay Apple Care on that okay now if you want to do a payment plan with apple with zero percent interest as well but you just want to pay it out over two years you do not have to get apple care now apple care costs have risen it's 129 for the seven mm-hmm. and the eight and below it is uh it is now for the plus line it is 149 for okay. all the plus phones that's per year uh that's for two years of coverage of apple care. gotcha okay and then if you're going to get the iPhone 10, they've raised the cost of Apple Care to $199. <laughs> are are, they, are so, they really expecting more problems with the 10? Well, I don't know if they're necessarily thinking about more problems, but I think the part of it is that screen is a custom screen, yeah. which actually Samsung is making for them. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see if that screen may be using the, the Note 9 or whichever one doesn't explode. Um, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was the but, 7. That's come and gone. I, I know. I it's just you know I, I I can't believe I kept that brand, but that you know I'm not. I could not make that decision at Samsung. I'm surprised it's it's selling well, but but it, good for them. I just would have a hard time trusting a company where their phones exploded at some point. So uh, I, Apple, it could happen to Apple or anyone, but I'm glad it hasn't. But um, but you know, you just be careful of what you're getting into. Look at the details of this. Uh, you know, uh, definitely uh, don't put yourself in a position where you're regretting what you're doing. Right. Don't need to be on the bleeding edge. You don't have to get an iPhone 10. You can go play with one in the Apple Store sure. when they have them. Um, so just uh, you know, these cameras have been really good for a while. Uh, you know, I really think anything from the six and above, which Apple is selling the SE, the six, and the plus, the seven and the plus, the eight and the plus, and the ten. Um, you know, I think they'll have good cameras there. You might be able to save a little money and even looking used uh, through all the various outlets that oh, are sure. out there. You can find an unlocked phone that's in really good condition that someone is, you know, trying to upgrade their phone. Right. Um, and then you don't have to worry about a payment at that time. Yeah. I just I just bought a couple of sixes, a, a 64 and 128 gig six um, used from a friend. Uh-huh. And uh, I was able to to I was able I was able to save a lot of money, especially for when you when you consider what I paid for the, the 128 model. So, yeah. And and my Moto X was used. I bought it off Amazon. It was 240 bucks. So, awesome. um yeah, that's and, and you know, we need to be good stewards. So I want to encourage everybody: be good stewards. Don't put yourself in a financial bind to get the uh, latest and greatest stuff. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And and um, you know, if, if you want to learn this how phone to, is going to be outdated in a year. Yeah, exactly. So. so yeah, so so don't sweat it, Caleb. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, thank I, you for having me. I, I appreciate you being here. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to uh, to to jump on literally at the last minute. I mean, it was bedtime last night, and we were talking, um, coming up with this idea and stuff. So I, I appreciate your willingness to do that. Thank you so much, buddy. Welcome. Uh, tell people where they can find you, where they can can go and learn. Yes, again, I uh, do a weekly podcast, um, Parents Press Play and Friends. You can find us over at parentspressplay dot com, and then I also have, if you're looking for more, just a like gaming news. Um, I do a lot of audio content over at cvgames.com. Okay. As well, I, I kind of do a, you know, kind of a, things that I find unique and interesting in the gaming industry. I, I do kind of like an audio editorial uh, format. Very cool. Very, very good. And uh, thanks, buddy. And uh, we'll have you on some more to talk uh, about more stuff like this. It might be interesting to, uh, to do a show where we uh, talk about gaming 
um, gaming and, and the family, gaming and the church. Um, uh, one of the things, just I'll put this bug in your ear. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy gaming and stuff like that has really grown in popular. The old board games uh, have yes. really grown uh, in popularity and stuff. And um, there have been some questions. Some people have, have been asking, you know, should we let our youth play Dungeons and Dragons? You know, because... You know, we grew up in the 80s where, um, you know, if you if you believe the news reports back then, kids were murdering themselves and killing each other. And it was suicide. I mean, they were dropping like hundreds in high school were just killing themselves when their <laughs> D&D character died and stuff. And, um, of course, I never knew any of those. But, um yeah. So always uh, a, another it, town that, where that happened. Yeah, it was two towns over or something. It was always, you know, something else. But anyway, that might be a, an interesting discussion to have. Uh, so yeah, anyway. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, uh, folks. I'm, Caleb and I are going to stay on the line for a minute and check the uh, chat room and all that. But guys, thank y'all so much for watching. Um, I hope this has been helpful. I hope this is um, this has been uh, a little bit of insight as to what's coming down. Uh, I hope we uh, haven't overloaded you with too much stuff. This is a long episode. I, I apologize for the hundred and let's see, it was an hour and and twenty, almost an hour and twenty minutes on this episode. So. Um, sorry to have taken so long, but guys, thank y'all so much for watching. Now, take what you've learned and go out there and change some lives.